52 Minutes of Heaven, we call the D1 Baseball Podcast. I am your host, Michael Patrick Rooney. Special edition, coach conversation today. Uh, as always, the podcast brought to us by our friends at S2 Cognition. S2 Cognition delivers a revolutionary approach to helping athletes understand how in-game decisions impact their performance from the youth levels all the way to the pros. Thanks again to our, our buddies at S2 Cognition. Um, I, I'm, but before we get done with S2, I've been learning about their assessments lately. I, I just, I would, anyone that's curious about, you know, how to hitters, you know, we see this all the time. Hitters with great swings, great athletes can't hit. It's because, you know, they're making bad decisions. They're, they're swinging, they're, what, what are they doing? They're swinging at the balls and they're taking the strikes. S2 Cognition is one of the few companies out there that, that I'm aware of that addresses that. Like, how do we get hitters better at swinging at the strikes and taking the ball? So anyway, I, I've, I've really enjoyed that. Today, I am joined by the great Kendall Rogers, the uh, TCU head coach, Kirk Sarlos, and then the great Joe Healy. And, and we've got a lot of transplants here. We've got Los, you're a SoCal guy who lives in Fort Worth now. Joe, you're a Texan who lives on the East Coast. I, I don't, I'm like a Philly guy that lives in the desert. Kendall, you're like the only guy that's true to your roots on this call. Good, I'm the good, only, good on I'm you, the only native Texan. I feel like Kirk is like converted, though. I feel like he's, he's from SoCal, but he's a Texan now. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, I still am SoCal. I got my rainbow nice. flip flops on. Okay, so I still, I still <laughs> am true to my roots. But yeah, I would consider myself. A are you Are cool you still working on TJ a little bit? You know what? He's slowly coming this way okay. in terms of being. We took him. We went yesterday as a staff uh, to the shooting range. Oh, that's so, that's that's yeah. Shot that's some right skeet. There. Shot some handguns. So there you go. yeah, we got to get a little text in him. He, he needs to get a, some cowboy boots and a cowboy hat. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Flip flops and a cowboy boots. That's great. Uh, boys, let's, let's start with this. Let's go off baseball. Let's, let's stay off baseball for a second. Uh, Coach Healy, you just came back from a cruise with your wife, which is awesome. Um, so here's the question for the four of us. And, and Joe, you can either mention the cruise or you can go, uh, you can go somewhere different. I want to know the best vacation you've taken in your adult life, best vacation you've taken as an adult. Would you go with the cruise, Joe, or would you go somewhere different? I'd go actually with a with a previous cruise I went on with my wife. We had just started we had just started dating. We actually weren't married at the time. We had just started dating, and you know how it goes. You're like you're dating someone, and you're all like you're excited about it. Like everything seems so fresh and exciting, you know, before the monotony of life has has really set in. So it was a did a cruise that had stops in the Dominican and San Juan, Puerto Rico, and um. Mm -hmm. Turks and Caicos, like it was just a lot of like the best beaches you could ever ask for. Right. And so we just spent a lot of time out in the sun and, you know, getting that vitamin D and uh, frankly, drinking way too much. Um, but that's part of a cruise, I guess. Um, so you're you know, a cruiser. You, you, you're, you're like you could, you could cruise for life, Joe. Like you, my parents, you know, like my, my dad should have a blog. He's been on so many cruises. <laughs> you know, it's funny how that works, because that's not what I've really set out to do. We do plenty of other vacations, but it's just like. The convenience of those is hard to beat, honestly, because you don't have to do a lot of planning. You can book them pretty short notice because you don't have to prepare much. You're not buying flights. You're not renting a car. You're not doing really any of that stuff. And my dad's so, gotten to you, Joe. I saw you never met my dad, but he's you're speaking his you're, you're talking right at his hymnal right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my 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 sentimental choice, too. I went to I, so I went to Disney when I was not quite an adult. This is like a but this is a sentimental answer like I it was the quintessential family vacation, right? So I'm a lot older than my siblings. So we, we, I never really got the experience of going on a big family vacation with my siblings when we were all, you know, little, right? So when I was in my teens, you know, and they were six and four, I think, um, we went to Disney World as a family. And, and I was not the target demo for Disney at 15, 16 years old. That's just not your, your thing at 16. But and it was, so it was one of those things that in the moment, I didn't appreciate it. In hindsight, though, like that's really the big family vacation we had together that we could all enjoy and have fun. And there's just like a lot of good pictures and memories from that trip. And so right. that's my sentimental answer is, the, is that family vacation because it was really the only the only version of that, that that I got. Yeah, that's awesome. I'll get you my dad's blog. It's off of his flip phone. So it's yeah, you're, you're, <laughs> that's it's just good. a series of text messages yeah, that he sends right. you. That's really all it is. Yeah. <laughs> he can't text message my mom. If you want to text message, my mom has to answer for him. Los, what are you going with? Uh, I would say my honeymoon, Bora Bora. Ooh. Ooh that yeah, that was great. fun. That was good times. Is that like just crystal clear waters and like feels like you're not even on the planet Earth kind of deal? Yeah, exactly. And you have what, overwater 
kind of bungalows. Where oh, you, yeah. those are look amazing. It's pretty sick, and it's like a glass bottom. So, like at night, they have lights that go from there. So you're you're in your room, and you look down. There's fish, you know, swimming around. It was it was pretty sick. I, that was probably awesome. for sure the best one. Man, that's awesome. Kr, what are you going with? Well, I'm just going to give people some advice. So in our honeymoon, we had a choice. We had a choice. We could have gone to the Cook Islands, which is around Bora Bora, same kind of feel. Or we could have gone to Jamaica. We did Jamaica. Don't do that, people. If you have the choice between Jamaica and the Cook Islands, do the Cook Islands. Uh, do the Pacific. But uh, I'll, I'll go with uh, St. John. We went there for the second time. We went two years ago, my wife and I. We, brought, we took the kids this last time. My wife thought I might have been a little crazy, wanting to take all the kids on a on – a, long Caribbean vacation like that but they did great and just to give you an idea I was sitting on a beach uh you remember when like Marshall coach Jeff Wagner like stepped down mm. like, I'm like sitting on a beach and like my wi-fi is real spotty but I sat there like typing a story on my phone while sitting at the beach in St. John so I, I don't stop working when I'm vacation runes no Martha never sleeps there's no question <laughs> about that that's awesome I, my wife will listen to the, like if my, if Jenny and I are driving down to Phoenix, which is two hours, sometimes we'll listen to the podcast. And if she listened to this podcast, this is, I'm going to get dinged for this. But if I'm being a hundred percent honest, my favorite vacation every year, it's very quick is I will go visit my parents at the Jersey shore, Sea Isle city, New Jersey. Uh, my parents have been going there every summer for two weeks since 1979. Um, and it's like, they put a chip in your neck. It's so like, blue collar and when i say blue collar i don't mean that as a compliment in this vein like just it's a budget vacation it's just like seattle city i love it um but it's like it's not like bora bora and seattle city should never be spoken in the same <laughs> day you know like it's yeah there's no <laughs> but I I'm, love a, it. I'm a little scared by the fact they put a chip in your neck Oh my gosh! Yeah. I, if they must, that's, what, <laughs> that's what Jenny thinks because she's like, "There's no way." She's like, "It smells." I'm like, "It smells like fun. It smells like no stress. It smells like festive. Like, what are you talking about? Of course, it smells." Uh, just sitting on a deck, looking at the Atlantic Ocean with with friends and family, having a beverage. It's like, oh, it's heaven on earth. There that's you awesome. go, so, go birds. There you go, go birds. Wawa, wawa for lunch. Thank you. All right. So let's talk baseball. Let, yeah. Let's get into this. So, so Los, I want to ask you a Cal State Fullerton question, and then we'll go around the horn. At the mm -hmm. end, for the four of us, I've got a topic that I want to, uh, we'll handle as a group, but let's go around the horn a couple of times. So, Los, my question for you is, you've been part of two great runs, like your, your guys run when you were a player at Fullerton, even when you were a coach at Fullerton, but I'm more focused on when you were a player. You know, you went to Omaha twice, if memory serves, as a player. Um, and then, you know, you've been assistant coach at TCU, four straight Omahas, which is just kind of ridiculous, right? Like four straight regionals is really hard in today's college baseball. But my, my question for you is, why, why were you guys so good at Fullerton in that era? Like in that George Horton era, why were you guys so good? And then is there anything about that that applies to what you're trying to build at TCU? Sure. First things first, is that a night? What is that? Cal, is that Cal State Fullerton? 79. That's a 79 team. Yeah, that's yeah, Augie. Tim Augie's Wallach. first title. Look yep. at Tim Wallach's face. It's like deadpan. We just won the World Series. He could not be more like, who cares? We just won deadpan. That's How his personality, that? right? Well, because I know that picture. You know, oh, when you go yeah. to Cal State Fullerton, <laughs> it's ingrained in your head. Like 79, what, 84, 84. 95, and 04. Like, you know yeah. the World Series pictures. They're up. And yeah, I've seen that picture a million times. So I saw it over over your shoulder, and I'm like, "Holy smokes, that's the Cal State Fullerton '79 championship team." That is them. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's. I mean, back to your question uh, for sure. I think the big thing that back in my Fullerton days was we were not going to be um, outworked. Mm -hmm. You know, Coach Horton, Coach Vanderhook, Coach Serrano. You know, we were going to be. Um, the most probably well-coached team in the country. So no matter who we played, we always felt like we had the X factor in terms of our coaching staff that was going to prepare us. And so, you know, and, you, and you, then you talk about the four college world series teams here at, at TCU. And it's like, you look back and you're like, wow, that's, that's in the midst of it. You're like, this is just what we do. 
But now as you look back, it's like, wow, that's that's pretty special stuff. And I think now being a head coach, being able to take those um, times when I was back at Cal State Fullerton and then my time here at TCU and going to four straight World Series, it's kind of trying to put both of those together. And then to try to have kind of the toughness and the grit of that Cal State Fullerton, those Cal State Fullerton teams when I played there, and then the you know, just the will to win when I was here as an assistant coach in four straight college world series and kind of put those together. You know, we want to be kind of, you know, blue collar, white collar approach, but blue collar work ethic, you know, and I think that's the big thing that we're going to be, we're going to try and be like everybody, the well, the best coach team, but also really talented and then put together that with some grit. And, and we're looking to hopefully go on a, on a run here and get to some college world series and hopefully win a national championship. Yeah. Lois, I'm going to kind of go back to the, the kind of the MLB playoffs right now. Last night, the Astros get the no hitter with the combined no hitter. And obviously I know Joe and I know, I don't know if Ruiz knows about this, but yeah. you know, you were a part of that no hit, that combined no hitter at Yankee stadium back in what was it? Oh, three with, with Roy O on the mound. 2004, I think maybe it was yeah. 03. I don't know. Joe, you yeah, know? I, mean, I remember that like it was yesterday, but, uh, you know, just, just kind of looking, you know, from afar, you know, you're watching, you know, the Astros get the no hitter last night with a combined no hitter. How do you, as a coach, like, how do you mold the, that kind of experience along with being in the AL championship series with athletics? How do you mold those experiences as players into your coaching and into your teaching, you know, in the locker room? Like, how do you, how do you take those experiences and kind of put those upon those guys? Well, I think a lot of it comes down to understanding what it takes to play at the highest level and then hold our guys accountable to, you know, hey, you chose to to play at TCU and the standard is the standard. And so uh, for them to understand, you know, college baseball is um, one thing and we're trying to get these guys prepared to pitch in the big leagues or play in the big leagues. And for our guys to understand that, hey, for you guys to be able to do that, it takes a ton of dedication, a ton of hard work. There, there are no office hours at the baseball field. Like if you want to get and become your ultimate best, you know, obviously we have to be within our time frame. But in terms of coming and hitting on their own and and um, being around the baseball field, you know, it takes what it takes to be the best you can be. You know, and and playing with some of the best players in the world during my time in Oakland and and Houston you really learn what it takes in terms of to be an elite player at the big league level, you know? And, and so just trying to impress upon our guys that, it, I mean, it takes what it takes. Like if you want to be great, you got to put the work in. Who was the toughest hitter you face as a pitcher? Ah, anybody that was left-handed. <laughs> left-handers <laughs> rake me. Um, you got to give me a top three. Give me a top, give me a top. Well, three. I mean, the first guy that comes to my mind you know, probably because he had two homers in, in one game off me was Fred McGriff, <laughs> the crime dog. The crime oh, yeah. dog. Crime dog. I tried to go sink her away. He jumped ship to dead center at Wrigley. And then I'm like, <laughs> okay, now I'm going to throw a cutter in. Because he stands like nine feet off the plate and has like a size probably 37-inch bat. So the first time, like I said, I went sink her away. He went dead center. So now I'm like, I got to crowd this guy. So I threw a cutter in, and then he helicoptered me into into the right field whatever that street is behind right field so fred mcgriff um shoot who else jim tome jim yeah. thome oh, as i like man. to call him like <laughs> anytime that you can like stay on baseballs and like go the opposite way and hit homers you know like i i, I feasted off guys that wanted to get pull happy you know because i didn't throw but 90 miles an hour so i was always going to pitch backwards but those lefties that could stay on baseballs and drive them the other way and, you know, yeah. leave the facility the other way gave me trouble. So Fred McGriff, Jim Tomei, um, you know, guys like that. Well, Vladimir Guerrero went like probably the longest homer ever upper deck in, uh, in Oakland, which at the time, I don't think anybody had seen a, a home run to the second deck down the left field line. And it was like rocket. Like people were diving out of the way. <laughs> That's funny. Well, that's assuming there were people up there uh, sitting up there. Uh, yeah, no, hey, oh, yeah. it's exactly. my little joke there. <laughs> uh, I did. Conf 
I did confirm uh, 2003 on the no hitter. Yeah. Uh, I read a little quick ESPN recap that made a note Real. that uh, the Yankees fans also booed Jeff Weaver on that day. So shout out to the Yankees. Was fans it was it Chris Jeff Burke Weaver on that team too? Um, he was. He hadn't been called up quite yet. I think next oh, okay. year was his first year. Yeah, so Jeff I, I was going to was our second baseman, and he literally we finished the game, and he literally had no idea that we just threw a no hitter. He's like. Why is everybody so happy? That's just another win, and and I think Vigio was like uh, Jeff. We just threw no no hitter. He's like, oh, cool. No yeah. idea. Well, that's part of that's part of the thing too. Is that I mean, combined no hitters happen. I don't want to say commonly, but fairly commonly now. But the idea of a combined no hitter in two thousand three was kind of strange, right? Yeah. Just because, and there was extenuating circumstances in this the, this situation. You know, a short start for for Roy Oswald. So like you know, but it, I think I was. I remember watching that game and I don't really know that I realized it until really late what was actually happening right. just because it was, it was not, you know, anyway, I, I was going to say quickly, do you remember we've, we said Roy Oswald, do you remember who the four other relievers who threw in that game? Oh were? yeah. It went Roy Oswald, Pete Monroe from yeah. the Northeast, Pat, Michael Patrick Rooney. Yeah. He's from That's New York. East. That's got New York written all over it. Yeah. Pete Monroe. He actually taught me, taught me my cutter. Cause no way. Yeah. So I was, I was a sinker, slider, changeup guy, and big league balls are way different than minor league baseballs. And so I couldn't really – there's no seams. So I kind of abandoned my slider and went to the cutter, and that was because of Pete Monroe, who he learned it from Roy Holiday when he was with, I think, the Phillies. So um, so Oswald, Monroe, then me, then – then it got to the good the good pitchers. It was uh, <laughs> Lidge, Dotel, Wagner. Oh, that's like, a pretty good trio. Yeah, well, and yeah. the crazy thing is, is um, um, so Brad Lidge threw the sixth. I, no, I think it was the sixth, maybe the seventh. But Dotel struck out four guys in one inning, mm. which is crazy. And then so the other cool story about that is usually, you know, in a combined no hitter, it's like the score's discretion – in terms of who's going to get the win. And I was like, I pitched the fifth inning. So I'm like, dude, I'm going to get the win. This is awesome. <laughs> and, and so luckily enough, I didn't get the win because they took a bunch of different paraphernalia to put in the uh, Hall of Fame. And they wanted the winning pitcher's hat, which it was, they gave it to Brad Lidge. My hat was full of pine tar and a bunch of different um, substances. So Good thing that my hat is not in the in the Hall of Fame because they would have known that I was basically a cheater. <laughs> Lois, I'm kind of curious. The Astros pitchers were talking last night about, oh, we we weren't paying attention to you know the fact they hadn't had a hit. I mean, as as a pitcher, like do you like should we really believe that? Like, no. do those guys really not notice that? I think when it becomes a kind of a combined no hitter, yeah. I think you kind of maybe that 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 holds some some truth. But I think if it's a starting pitcher and it's only one or maybe two, like, you know, like, how can you not? Right. But I think when it's so many different guys, you kind of get lost in it, and especially, I mean, in a World Series. I mean, that's, you know, that's probably taking a back seat because you're trying to just get a W, you know, and you probably don't really recognize that. But, yeah, I don't I don't really believe people when they say, oh, yeah, I didn't know I, did. I had a no hitter until the, the last out. I'm like, yeah, right. Everybody knows. Right. <laughs> Like, I haven't given up a hit. Everybody knows that. Yeah. The Phillies fans are yelling at you that you have a no-hitter going. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so let's uh, let's move forward and talk a little bit. little TCU baseball. Why uh, Why not? We'd be remiss if we, uh, <laughs> we didn't talk a little yeah. TCU while we got you. Um, you know, you, you, you took over kind of at an interesting time, I feel like, just because – Y'all's roster, as much as any power conference team, I think over the last couple of years, just had a bunch of guys who feel like they'd been there forever, yeah. right? And so the last two off seasons, you've kind of had some attrition there. So what has been the nature kind of of your first couple of falls in the job in terms of the level of competitiveness, understanding not only do we need to find productive players to fill in these roles, but also there's, there's more than likely a little bit of a leadership vacuum given some of the veterans you've had leave. Yeah, great question because that's exactly what it is. I mean, you know, my, what was it? two years ago when I was still an assistant coach, we had, like you said, we had probably six guys that were in their super senior year and were 24 years of age, you know? So guys that have been around the block that have had, you know, probably five, six, seven hundred at bats, you know? And when those guys left, which was last year, 
it becomes, you know, some some roster roster attrition and trying to figure out who the leaders are. And then same thing this year, we have 22 new players. So that has been the big thing. And it could be, I think it could be good because now all of a sudden um, you can kind of set the tone in terms of what you want going forward to be able to, you know, have guys step up and be leaders, but also not change the culture, but have the culture be what you want as, as the head coach. And I think now, you know, our freshman class, this was the first freshman class since COVID to be on campus for summer school. And I've noticed a huge change in terms of the togetherness, the, the, the um, camaraderie with our team, just because these freshmen feel like they were on campus for about a month and got, you know, got to be pretty close with one another. And then they really, they just kind of seamlessly transitioned with the older players. And next thing you know, it's a really close group. And I think that has a lot to do with because they were here for summer school and felt like they were part of the program before the program started, you know, in August with the regular regular uh, calendar year. Love it. Hey, boys, before we go round two, I just want to um, I want to give a shout out to the ABCA. That's a new partnership for us at D1 Baseball that we are just absolutely thrilled about. You know, coaches, I'm sure you're aware of it. Any coaches that are listening, the annual convention for the ABCA is coming up. It's January 5th through the 8th, 2023 at the Gaylord Opryland in Nashville. It's the biggest and best baseball weekend of the year. I'm going to go off script now and just say, any coach listening, if you have not signed up yet, like push pause, go do that. Christmas is coming up. Again, you know, we've all been there, high school coach, junior college coach, volunteer coach. It's it's not a free trip, but it's you got to make it happen. Just borrow money, do whatever you got to do. It is so worth it. The investment that that you will be able to bring back to your team as a better coach, the investment in your career, the networking, all those types of things. It is uh, it, it's literally you could argue it's the best baseball weekend of the year. So I want to encourage everyone if you've kind of already mentally said, I don't think I can do it financially. Like, let's flip that mindset and figure it out. It, it, it's the, it'll be the best change your mind of, of your baseball life. So again, really appreciate our, our buddies at the ABCA and thrilled to have that partnership. So um, there you go. We, we will all be in Nashville too, by the way. KR, you, why don't you uh, take lead us off for round two here? Yeah, I'm kind of diving into coaching a little bit. You know, Kirk, when I talk to like young coaches, he'll email me a lot, mainly like a lot of volunteers, like, hey, like, how, how you know, how do I advance in coaching or like, you know, how do I become a head coach? I guess from your perspective as a guy who obviously was an ultra successful assistant for so long, uh, took over the head coaching job there at TCU. Like may, what is like maybe the one thing when you became a head coach that maybe surprised you a little bit? And what is kind of maybe your advice for young coaches that are looking for like the pathway to become a head coach? Because, you know, there, there are so many elements to college baseball now that weren't present a decade ago. I mean, there's, there's NIL, uh, you're you're managing egos like you're you're a CEO essentially managing egos in a company. Uh, it's a lot different than it was a decade ago. Yeah, for sure. I th- I'll tackle the fir- uh, the second question first. I think sure. um, really it's networking, you know. And it's it's in my opinion, it's about it's not trying to find the next job. You know, I think a lot of times this job this this profession can be okay. Well, that. I'm going to go there and then go here and then go there. I think a lot of times, um, you know, having some consistency and having some stability at a place, I think helps you out as opposed to kind of being the guy that bounces around all the time. Um, you know, and, and then in terms of like networking, I think going to the ABCA, I think that's a huge deal because you get a, you get to meet a lot of different people from a lot of different programs. Um, out on the recruiting trail, being able just to talk to different uh, people from different programs and understand and just basically kind of getting your name out there in terms of, you know, obviously there's no substitute for hard work, you know, and I think, you know, that's that's one of the big things in terms of like the recruiting portion of it. It's such a major part of being a coach and a college coach that, you know, if you're if you're known for being a hard worker on the recruiting trail, you're going to get doors open to you that, a lot of people wouldn't, you know, just because um, of what you do on the recruiting trail and evaluating talent. So it's kind of all encompassing. 
you know, and I think there's, like I said, there's no substitute for hard work. And I think the harder you work, the luckier, luckier you get. And um, on, in terms of the other question, as a head coach, man, there's there's a lot of things that I learned. You know, it's 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 one thing when you think you're prepared. It's another thing when you actually sit in the head coach's chair. And for me, the biggest probably eye opener was 95 percent of this job has nothing to do with being down on that field. You know, it's basically like you talked about. It's about, um, you know, holding our players accountable. It's about academics. It's about, you know, donors. It's about promoting the program. It's all those things. And then the last 5% is out there on the baseball field. So, <laughs> you know, I think that was probably the biggest learn thing that I learned was how much time that you spend in here as a head coach you know, a lot of people and myself included, it's okay, head coach, write the lineup, make pitching changes. That's what I do. Well, most of it is, that's that's really, like I said, 5% of it. 95% of it is all the other stuff. You're, you're shaking hands and kissing babies. Yeah, absolutely. No doubt. Speaking of head coaches, you uh, added TJ Bruce to your coaching staff and a guy who had a lot of success out at Nevada as a, as a head coach. And, um, you know, for, what does he bring to the table, not just as an individual and with his his own coaching acumen, but also just having basically a second head coach in the dugout, yeah. someone who sat in your seat and be able to give you a second set of eyes in that way. Yeah, he's been awesome. You know, I, I've known TJ actually, actually since I was 14 years old. Um, I played with his cousin, Joe Herka, uh, for the Pico Rivera Dodgers back in the day. So it's kind of, you know, now all these summer summer teams, this was like the the best summer team in Southern California for a while. And so um, I played with his cousin and TJ was probably three years younger, I think than us. And he was kind of like the kid that was in the dugout bat boy running around, just wanted to be, you know, next to the older kids. And so that's where I first met TJ. And then being in, you know, at Cal state Fullerton and him being at UCLA, we got to know each other, you know, obviously even more. And then um, we've always you know, kept in con, you know, in contact uh, when he was at Nevada and when when I was here. And so, when that when Coach Mo took the job at Ohio State, he kind of you know he said he sent sent me a text and said, "Hey, I'm ready." And so, next thing you know, hiring him and then bringing him here. The cool thing is, I've been around Mo for ten years. So, really, in my coaching kind of career, the only thing that I knew was really Coach Mo Ziello you know, in terms of the offensive side of things. And so now to have Coach Bruce come in with some new ideas and, and some different thoughts, but still very similar to Coach Mo, but says it in a different way, does it in, in a different way, has new ideas, it's been a lot of fun just because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's new for me as well. And it's new for our players. And you can see now that our players have kind of gotten grasp of what he's doing, you know, the last two weeks have been phenomenal in practice because um, he's pushing buttons and they're executing, you know, and I think it, the cool thing is, is having him and a head coach and we kind of talk about different things um, as a head coach. And his main thing, like he told me, was like, hey, I know what it's like to be in that chair. And if I can do anything for you in terms of taking some of those responsibilities away and helping you out, that's what I'm here to do. And so he's just been a, 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 a awesome. amazing resource for me, um, you know, in a short time here. Love it. Hey, Los, I want to ask you about two hitters. So Braden Taylor is one good of the best. Yeah, good, good hitter. Good player. So, so, and then the other player I want to ask you about is David Bishop. Yep. Who just, so Braden Taylor's fascinating to me because, you know, I've never <laughs> spoken to the person, but he seems really <laughs> quiet. Like he's just this great player who his game is loud, but he, yeah. I don't know, like he, it's, it, it, he, it, I, I'm curious to get your take on him. And then David Bishop seems to me like if you made me like make a wager on future star, I don't know. He just seems big and loose and like there's bat speed. Um, but again, I, I feel like I don't know those <laughs> two players as well as you would normally know, like that level of talent. Tell us yeah. about those two kids. You're right on the money with Braden. You know, it's, it's, it's quiet, but, don't mistake quietness for not being competitive. Like he's one of the most competitive players on our team. And when the big moment arrives, you know, comes, he's, he's just, you know, 
foaming at the mouth to be there for it. And uh, but every once in a while, you'll kind of see him, you know, kind of get after it a little bit where it's like he has that in him. But for the most part, he's kind of like this, you know, and I think it helps him in terms of being a great hitter, you know, because he's kind of just consistent uh, personality wise. And uh, but when the moment comes, it's never too big for him, you know, and like he single handedly. We had game two of our purple white World Series yesterday. He was playing short. And he had a couple hits, but he single-handedly on defense, he made three plays that the only other people that I, you know, see make those plays are the guys that are playing in the World Series on TV, you know, with the Astros, with Pena, or or with the Phillies. I mean, he's Mm -hmm. up the middle twice, in the six hole another time, and had plenty of arm to get it done. So, I mean, it was pretty special. So, um, but you're right on. Awesome kid. And then David Bishop – you know, he had a he was in our four hole from day one as a freshman last year. And he had a great start to his season. Then he got hit by 96 on his hand and really never recovered. You know, he had a tough second half of the season. And so far this this fall, he's put on probably 20 pounds. Like he looks he's he's he looks like what it's supposed to look like now. You know, very physical, um, very strong, and I'm excited for him to have a, a great season. You know, his big deal is laying off pitches out of the zone, like anybody. All great hitters lay off pitches out of the zone. You know, the best hitters swing at strikes and take the balls. So I think that's his big probably learning curve is making sure that we're swinging at strikes. When he swings at strikes, it's pretty loud. Yeah. Taylor, what, what will he play short, Low, Sorry, Kara. Yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah he's, he's moving to short. Well, is he going to play short or can he play short? Interesting. You could answer both questions if you care to. Yeah, just just give us some more scoop. Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing is, is, you know, we have, you know, Anthony Silva is a very, you know, high-end talent for us that we're really looking for him to, you know, he's a freshman. We're really looking for him to play um, shortstop. You know, Braden plays such a good third base. You know, I think, is there some times when maybe we do some different things? Yeah. You know, but for the most part, he'll probably start at third base. You know, he'll, mm-hmm. he'll, he'll be at third, but – Man, it's it's pretty tough when you watch what he did yesterday to to think, you know, how's this guy? Not, I mean, how's this guy not playing shortstop? You know, but we're trying to figure out the best nine, and we're still figuring it out. It. Runes, by the way, I'm not going to let you uh, become the leader of the Braden Taylor fan club. That's me. That is way. you. That's true. Uh, I've been on that guy since day one, but uh, he he was special in the College Station Regional last year. He made the what was it? The great play in the line drive at third. Yeah. Hit what two or three home runs in that regional. Yeah. Uh, Lowe's, who, who was maybe like a, a big leaguer that you played with that he kind of reminds you of? I think on the collegiate level, personality-wise and looks-wise, he kind of reminds me of Heston Kierstad when he was at Arkansas. Yeah. But uh, who does he remind you of big league-wise? Great. Good question. I would say kind of in terms of your your Kierstad, I would kind of mix him with um, Brandon Shoemake. You know, from oh, yeah, that's a great comp from AM. Oh, yeah, that, that yeah, call. both both him and Kirstow were both kind of quiet but ultra competitive. Yeah, and kind of as I would say with Shoemake, it's very similar in terms of his swing as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very flat. Um, I think probably Brayden has a little bit more, you know, I think Shoemake was a little bit more left center, kind of that, yeah, you know, stroke where Brayden runs into baseballs and hits him out of the ballpark to the pole side, but. From a professional standpoint, yeah, I might have to come back to that one. You kind of put me on the spot. Those are those are two pretty good comps, though. Yeah, yeah I mean, those are high level college players that are now going to make their way to the big leagues probably yeah. in the next year or so. Yeah, Kerstad's raking in the fall league, which is super cool to see given Absolutely. the injuries that he's suffered. All right, boys, let's wrap with this. So the four of us are the commissionership of college baseball for this for the next ten minutes. We, we have, uh, you know, we, we hold the remote control. Now, I'm going to force us into a topic. We're going to talk about the postseason. And I'm going to throw my cards out there first, and then you guys have the right to agree, disagree, you know, swerve us in different directions. So I would like to see us expand the postseason in college baseball. I would like to see us go to 72 teams. I would also like us to go to the 32-host model where everything's a three-game series. Um, you know, the issues with that are it's an extra week of the season. I, I get that. That's a real thing. That's not a that's not a um, I, I still would like to do it, but I, I don't want to belittle that 
objection. That's a, that's a that's a real thing. You make a long postseason a little bit longer. I think that's a good thing. My reason for wanting to expand the postseason, though, is if you look at pro sports, and if even if you look at business, the principle is you take your best property and you expand it. That's how you grow an enterprise. And and you know, right now for the for college baseball, sixty four out of three hundred and five teams make our tournament. That's twenty one percent of our teams. If you look at the major sports, the NFL, it's like 44%, over twice the number of teams as us. MLB is 40%, literally twice. So anyway, I like the idea of 72 teams, the top eight seeds get a playing game before they play their three-game series, a playing game on Thursday night. So that gives them an advantage. Here's my concern if we expand to 72 and don't do 32 hosts. Now you could be asking a team to play six games in five days the week after their conference tournament. And the pitching there just seems like an absolute car wreck. Like it just, that feels completely untenable to me. So anyway, uh, Joe, let's have you go first. Los, you're going to be our closer on this. Joe, you're going to go first. So what, what do we, hey, and by the way, our postseason is really good right now. I don't want to. I don't want to disregard that point either. Like you are, I'm asking us to fix something that not only it's not broken, it's thriving. So, so what say you on the postseason, Joe? Well, you know, feel free to boo me for this answer, like the Yankees fans <laughs> booed Jeff Weaver on that day in 2003. <laughs> but I'm less concerned about the how. Or, I'm sorry. Let me put. It, I'm less concerned about the logistics of like expanding or what ha- or keeping it as is and more about that how do we arrive there mm. just because what i don't want to see happen is um the regular season become uh, more meaningless right and i'm not saying sure. it's meaningless now but becoming increasingly meaningless and this is a debate we're having in college football now right i mean they're going to 12 teams and there's like well every week is a playoff in college football and the counter argument is like well yes but if you lose a game in october you're pretty much done yeah. as far as a national title contention goes right so like you know college baseball is in a different place now we saw last year with Ole Miss that hey they lose literally lose one more game and they are not getting in right I mean they had zero margin for error and there was a good argument to make to be made that I didn't necessarily agree with it but that they didn't deserve to be in right reasonable people could make that argument and look what they did right so college baseball is just in a different place um But what I don't want to see is the regular season get to a point where you may remember softball a few years ago, and I'm not an expert on on college softball. Great product, though. Fun to watch. Um, Every SEC school got into the NCAA tournament. And maybe they were all deserving. I don't know. Like, I really don't. But, I mean, okay. So the regular season really didn't. It was was, They were determining seeding in the SEC that season in college softball. So I don't want it to be some version – of that, even if those might be 14 of the most talented teams in, in college baseball, like I don't want to see it become that. Now, I will give you a real answer now because you deserve a good question deserves a, a thought out answer. I'm with you on th- I would do 32 hosts. I think I'd keep it where it is. Um, I want to maintain access for the best, uh, the automatic bids like that's to me, that's like non-negotiable. And the NCAA basketball tournament is, is dealing with that kind of thing too. I don't want to lose automatic access for, for all conferences. You win the auto bid. Great. You move on. Um, I would keep it where it is, but I would do 32 hosts. I've, I've grown on this. Like as, as time has gone on, I used to be a purist. Like I love the chaos of regional weekend and don't get me wrong. It's, it's fun as all get out. Right. Who didn't, who didn't love watching Arkansas and Oklahoma state just kind of like be a heavyweight prize fight last last year in regionals right that was just a lot of fun to kind of watch play out but you get to the end of regional weekend and and especially when you go to mondays those games just don't resemble anything like what college baseball looks like at its best like let's just let's call a spade a spade let's call it what it is and coaches are having to make really hard decisions and we don't need to tell coach sarlos about that i mean they're having to make really tough decisions about what they do on the mound especially when you get to those games and you're balancing long-term health of a kid with winning a a very important game. And I I just, I just don't want to have to put anybody in those kind of positions if we don't have to. And so I I, I'm with going to 32 hosts. I also think it's good for college baseball. Hey, let's, let's have some places that don't host under the current format, uh, get an opportunity to do that. Let's show their fans what high level college baseball in the postseason looks like, because I think we could, we could hook a lot of casual fans into becoming bigger fans of college baseball. So if you're holding my feet to the fire, let's keep it 64, but let's do 32 hosts. Let's play 
the same format in the postseason that we play during the regular season. And we could more or less do that. Omaha gets a little different. I get it. But we could mostly yeah. play two out of three throughout the entirety of of the postseason. So, if, again, you're holding my feet to the fire. That's where I'm going to go. But ultimately, I'm less concerned with with that and just more concerned with how do we kind of um, continue to make the postseason the best of the best and the teams that really have a chance to win a national title. I love it. KR, what say you? Well, that was a really thought out answer. Uh, yeah, Joe, this is not going to be as well thought out, but it's going to be very direct. Uh, I, I'm for expanding teams of the tournament. Uh, you know, if you look at the last five years in the NCAA tournament, you've had three teams that, are, that were one of the last five teams in make it to Omaha. You had Michigan in 19, you had AM in 17, and you had Ole Miss last year win the national championship. So two of those three teams either played or won a national championship. So I think when you have a tournament where the la- one of the last five teams is doing that and they had a tough time even coming to the conclusion that those five teams should even be in the tournament, that tells me there's a lot of depth. And so I, I do feel like in college baseball, I don't know if you guys disagree with me here, but I do feel like in college baseball, if you go from 64 to 72, you can legitimately look at those teams and go, you know what, I think they have a really good re- really good like pitch to be in. I do think when you get past that number – you're looking at teams that are like, you know what, they don't really have any business being in. Like, I feel like there's a pretty big drop-off when you get to 70 and 72, so I do like going to that. And I actually, I'm with Joe. I like the idea of going to a three-game series throughout, you know, whether it's all, all the Super Regionals, you know, Kirk and the Frogs have with A&M and so on. Like, when you experience the three-game series, I want one team's best against the other team's best. I do not want a situation where, you know, Kirk and a regional – is out of pitching because he used everybody on Saturday and all of a sudden he's playing like an elimination game or another team's playing an elimination game and they're out of pitching. Like that to me, that is not like the the 100% determinant on who the better team is. I think when you line up, play a three-game series, that's who the best team is. And I, I would like to see the tournament do that. And again, when we're sitting over here as talking heads saying, these these athletic directors need to need to fund baseball more. We want more scholarships. We want more coaches. Well, what's the best way to tell an athletic director in the north or in the northeast or the Pacific Northwest to invest more money or to fight to invest more money in college baseball? It's to create a product that's more marketable. And how do you make it more marketable? You can actually go out there and sell people on hey. Indiana State's going to host a regional. They're going to host a mm-hmm. first round of a regional, which they would have done two years ago. So uh, I, I'm all for that as well. Los, what say you? Well, I mean, I'm just going to echo what, what those two just said. You know, the czar of bracketology, <laughs> Kendall Rogers, who says after, what is it, after 72, it's pretty pretty cut and dry. I feel like after 72, there's a pretty big drop. Like, I feel like yeah. after the seven, even the 70 mark, sure. those next six teams, I feel like there's a pretty big drop off. Yeah, those resumes yeah. are dinged. Yeah. I always feel like those bubble teams, whether no matter what sport it is, like right now, the bubble teams yeah. of like the first college football playoff ranking came out, and, you know, my, my Horn Frogs are at seven. Um, so I always feel like there's always, my question is, is when it gets to 12 for football, now is it going to be an argument for, Team 13, 14, 15. You know, it always seems like that yeah. bubble line is always, you know, the the question mark. And I think including more teams, I think is great. I'm a huge fan of making 32 hosts or whatever it would be with 72. Um, in terms of the more like you look, you look right now with the World Series, you know, like people love playoff baseball. Mm-hmm. And if we can get playoff baseball on campuses more campuses around the country and especially campuses that don't usually have it, I think makes a huge difference in terms of the the health of the sport and people being invested in it. All of a sudden now, Hey, remember that playoff game? Remember that, that regional that we yeah. went to, if I'm an Indiana state Sycamore fan, right? All of a sudden now, like maybe we, we, we do go to those, you know, March and April games because of how much fun we had in, in June. And so, um, the more places that we can have host playoff baseball, I think is absolutely a no brainer for this sport. You yeah. know, I think, and a lot of times with hosts and it's, it's mostly about, well, can they, is there enough bathrooms? Is, is there enough, um, you know, uh, seating? Is there, do they have lights? I think, I think you kind of throw that out the window and you saw Maryland this last year. I mean, talk That's about awesome. an awesome environment yeah. of, of college baseball. Why can't that yeah. be at, at more places around the country and figure out, pack the place in and 
bring in stands, bring in porta potties. Who cares? You mm -hmm. know, let's get more baseball and playoff baseball around the country on campus. Well, here's the other thing, too, is like when, when should there ever be a situation where the Big 12 champion is on the road at a rival in a region? Well, that was your fault, Kendall. You were the, <laughs> that was not my fault. You were all the projections. You just love the fact that, hey, let's have this TCU, A&M no. thing again. You love that. You literally I actually love that. Came out, I actually came out saying that TCU should be hosting even no, with a every with projection you had TCU on the road at A&M. Right. And then the, been, the, the, the committee looks at your – Dude, I'm just giving the people anyway. what they it's want. It's your fault, Kendall. You just, you <laughs> I'm just giving the people like what this. they want. Like Mr. Birds. <laughs> he really was. That that we do need to confirm. Oh, we man. we need to confirm that in the in the room, the the selection committee has the nerd cast playing in the background. That yeah. feels factual. Absolutely that... factual. <laughs> but I, but I feel like more often than not, they're trying to avoid what we're what we're trying to push onto them. Oh, so great. By the way, this it's another great time. Mike Buddy, uh, jo so John Cohen will be the selection chair this year. But Mike Buddy, man, that was like an all time great press conference. And Mike Buddy's a baseball guy, pitched in the big leagues, an yeah. awesome dude. But man, he it, it, one of the toughest fields to put together in history. And he, man, his his he he handled that beautifully. Good good job, Coach Buddy. So gotta love it. Los, this was awesome. Really, Love really it. appreciate the time. Uh, good luck to the Frogs the rest of the fall. Tell uh, Coach Bruce and everyone else we said hello. And, and again, we, we appreciate that. This. this is uh, we're, we're looking forward to seeing, uh, seeing you with all your continued success at TCU. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks, yeah. Hey, boys, before we say goodbye to the listeners, um, tons of great stuff on the website right now. This is my favorite time of the year on the website because of fall reports. It's the perfect way to kind of whet your appetite for next year. Uh, if you don't have a subscription, I want to encourage you to do so. You just uh, When you get on there, type in Fall 22 at checkout, Fall 22. You get 20% off. My UNLV report, Los, your SAT verbal score will go up 100 points if you read. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Words like nary, N-A-R-Y. Words like consonant. I counted a kid's consonants in his last name. So I'm just saying. Riz, I'm here to Riz, make that people is better. Dr. Sarlis to you? <laughs> that's right <laughs> oh the doctorate so. like, by, by the way Kirk, you did not report i can't wait to read it runes yes oh it's kirk, kirk, you did not introduce your right? uh, mascot say what, what kirk did not introduce his mascot in the background oh uh, but one of the podcasts yeah let's let's see it oh, oh no there he way. is oh, look day, he looks up like what do you want oh, come here does he come in every day uh he does so he's like the um you know, he's the emotional support animal, you know? <laughs> so if the guy goes 0 for 4 with four, four pu punches, it's all right. Bud will pick him up. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, he's a chief. He's a, he's a, he's, he's a good boy. Yeah, the, the, the guys love him, and, yeah, he, he he hangs out most days. Oh, that's awesome. Can I call you Patrick from now on, Runes? I didn't Wait. know your middle name was Patrick. That's, like, so Patty. funny. We need to call him Patty. Patty. Patrick, that's so yeah. Irish. You know, there, there are – I'm the third – and then yeah, there there are like there are like four Michaels in our family, so like that's why you, you don't like I I've barely even answered a Mike or Michael. It's like you never get called that. He's a Philly so. guy. Runes, are that's you right. a Phillies fan? Yeah. Growing up, Larry Boa man choked oh, okay. up on the bat. Like there was more bat below his hands than above his hands. Larry. Who Boa. else is on those teams? Dutch Dalton. Uh, Dalton's on the '93 athlete? team. So the teams I grew up with were like Larry, May, uh, um, Bob Boone catching. Yep. Um, Luzinski in left, Gary Maddox in center. Wow. Uh, Sarge Matthews in right, and all. Uh, um, Von Hayes started to sneak in there. Uh, Bowett shortstop, Manny Trio at second, Mike yeah. Schmidt at um, third. Who the heck was the first baseman? See, I'm gonna quiz you on this one because you're like the stump the Schwab. What was what's um um what's Michael Schmidt's middle name? Jack Jackson. See? Yeah, because uh, Harry Callis would say that. Harry Callis would say Michael Jack Schmidt See, when he hit a big home run. I think the next the next D one deal that you guys do is just stump the Schwab, you and Moziello, oh, Mo. and just fiery fire questions and trivia questions back and forth at at one another and see who wins. Los, that you know the year Mo guy. was with us at ASU two thousand one after he left OU, like we we would be on flights and I would just pepper Mo with like old school Fullerton questions yeah. and, and 
I could tell Murph was like, I'm going to actually come punch you guys in the face. If this <laughs> like, I'm so annoyed right now. So yeah. great. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Love good. it. Well, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. You got thanks it, buddy. For college baseball. Really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Be good, Los. All right.